Hello, I'm Dr. Younger. I'm director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Laboratory. I apologize. I was not able to do a video last week. I couldn't get into the lab over the weekend, but I'm back now and we can pick up where we left off. So I've been conducting analyses for grant applications. I want to share some of the new data and some of the new results I've been looking at. So specifically, I want to talk about C-reactive protein, which we abbreviate CRP. And if you follow my videos, you know that CRP is a really important blood test for tracking inflammation. And that's because it's a very sensitive and fast marker of general systemic inflammation throughout your body. It's also a very common blood test and it's pretty inexpensive. So again, CRP is C-reactive protein. It is one of the first responders, one of the first immune responders to anything. So if your immune system is tackling some problem, whether it's a pathogen or an injury, your CRP is going to be one of the first things to be elevated as it's mounting that immune response. So we can use it to know if you have a generally low or a medium or a high level of inflammation throughout your body. And that is something we want to avoid. If you have chronic inflammation, that can damage your tissue, especially the vessels of your cardiovascular system and your heart. But it can also make your pain and fatigue considerably worse. And so that's why it's really important in my fibromyalgia and MECFS and gopherillness work. I've been tracking this for uh, many, many years, and I see strange uh, or unexpected elevations in these chronic diseases that my research is showing the inflammation is really important to how severe their pain and fatigue is. So what I want to do today is I'm going to show you some brand new CRP values. These are values that we collected this year on 140 individuals with Gulf War illness. So they have symptoms like ME-CFS and fibromyalgia. They have a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue, and a lot of cognitive issues. And I'm just now looking at these data. Now, next week, I am going to pull my data on fibromyalgia and ME-CFS. We have a lot of data on those groups as well, and I have not looked at those. So if I can look at those over the next week, I can present that next week and we'll see if those data look the same and those conditions look the same as what I'm presenting today. So anyway, let's take a look right here. Now, what we're looking at is kind of a scatter plot and the bottom is low CRP, so low inflammation, and at the top is high inflammation, high CRP. So you can see it's zero at the lowest end and the highest value is uh, right about 11. So first of all, what's a normal C-reactive protein or CRP? You want as close to zero as possible. But anything below 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, so again, 0.3, not three, but 0.3, that's a healthy level. You can see I'm indicating that with this circle. So you want to have your CRP level somewhere in this range to have a healthy level of CRP. Now, a quick note, I'm using milligrams per deciliter. Some labs may use milligram per liter. And if they're showing you milligrams per liter, you have to move the decimal point to the right one to get milligrams per deciliter. So just want to make that clear. You have to pay attention whether it's a deciliter or a liter. And I'm only going to be talking about milligrams per deciliter. So that's the healthy level below 0.3. Next level is from 0.3 to 1 milligram per deciliter. And this is what we call low-level inflammation. Now, this could be caused by obesity, could be caused by smoking, could be caused by even gingivitis, just gum disease, could cause low-level inflammation. Now, if you, if you have this value, your clinician is unlikely to be concerned. Uh, they will say, you know, this is kind of typical inflammation, especially if you're older, like maybe the age over the age of 50, this isn't very concerning. And it's true that there's not a lot of good scientific information suggesting that values in this level are dangerous. So even though it is indicating kind of sustained systemic inflammation, which shouldn't be good, there's really no data suggesting that it's actively seriously harming your system. So between 0.3 and 1, we don't get really concerned. Now, the next level is between 1 and 3. Now, this is a concerning level of CRP, and it means that the inflammation that is 
kind of hitting your system every day is probably high enough to be harming your cardiovascular system. It's going through your heart, it's going through your blood vessels, and it's damaging that tissue as it moves through. And so your risk of cardiovascular conditions like stroke, um, other heart disease conditions is increased. Now, if you get between three and 10, this is a very concerning level of CRP. It means there's significant inflammation in your body and you have a greatly increased risk of having some kind of cardiovascular problem. Now, the values can go even higher than that. Uh, I typically see values as high as 13 milligrams per deciliter, and uh, and those are chronic elevations. So that's suggesting to me like a very severe, maybe kind of a autoimmune type disorder. Now, above that level, if, if you get higher than 13, you probably have a an acute bacterial or viral infection. And if it's really high, like 50 or 100, then it's almost certainly a bacterial infection. So if you get your CRP tested when you're sick, it's probably not an accurate reflection of your true chronic CRP level. So keep that in mind, because if you get sick, your CRP levels are going to go high, but it may only last a day or two or, or three. So transient high CRP is not not a concern. It's supposed to it's supposed to be increased when you get sick or you have an injury. That's what it's for. Um, so I'm only talking about chronic levels. Now, uh, the healthy adult in the U.S. should have around 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, maybe 0.4 if you get kind of a 50 or older. It does raise a little bit as you get older. But you can see here from the scatter plot that with Gulf or illness, that is not the case at all. Clearly, while some of them do have normal levels, many, if not most, have abnormally elevated CRP. And this is, this is quite concerning. I can see here that 66% of the sample has at least the moderately high inflammation, so the moderately high risk. And then 32% have significant risk, so they have three or above. And so for this goal for illness sample, and the population in general, I believe that controlling this inflammation that's marked by high C-reactive protein is going to be really important to managing their condition and to minimizing their pain and fatigue and cognitive issues. Now, everything I've just told you is pretty common medical knowledge. It's not very controversial, but there's another reason why I think CRP is really important, and it's this right here. The CRP, I've shown in many studies is a significant predictor of fatigue in chronic disease like MECFS and Gulf illness and fibromyalgia. And as I noted, CRP changes very rapidly. And it changes so rapidly that you can measure day-to-day -day changes to track how bad your fatigue is. So I can look at your CRP and using the CRP, I've got a very good guess of how bad your fatigue is going to be from between good and bad days. Because if you have a really bad fatigue day, your CRP is probably going to be elevated. And that suggests that the reason you have bad fatigue days is because your inflammatory system has kicked in more than usual. So I'm showing three individuals here as examples. These people were all measured over 25 days. The red is their C-reactive protein and the blue is the fatigue. And I basically just want to show you that you can see that these lines track together. There's a relationship between the C-reactive protein or the inflammation and the fatigue. And that means, obviously, if we reduce the inflammation, we should improve the fatigue. So suppressing CRP, I think, should be a goal in these chronic conditions. Now, as I said a couple minutes ago, I suspect we'll see the exact same thing in fibromyalgia and MECFS. But I haven't looked at it yet, so I can't say that for sure, but we'll find out. So that's my hypothesis, is that it'll look very similar to what we're looking at right now, which is Gulf for illness. So I'll grab those data over the week. I'll run some quick analyses. We'll, do, we'll look at the plots, and we'll see. So hopefully I can present that um, next week. Now, if we see the same thing, I'll talk more about what we can do about CRP. Now, uh, a few notes, and then we'll wrap up. First of all, CRP is not a normal part of your medical screening, like your yearly, uh, your annual physical, your checkup, you typically won't have CRP tested. Uh, 
And the reason why is because CRP is very nonspecific. It can tell you if you have inflammation, but it can't tell you why. If you already have obesity, if you have hypertension, if you have diabetes, if you're a smoker, your clinician is going to assume you have inflammation. And so they're going to think, what's the point of running CRP? We know that you have inflammation because you have one of the major risk factors for inflammation. And that's probably true. I don't think that's wrong. But I can tell you that after running hundreds of people with fibromyalgia and ME-CFS and similar conditions, that there are a significant number of people who don't have risks for inflammation. They don't have obesity. They're not smoking. They eat a healthy diet, but they have pain and fatigue, and no one knows why. When I measure their C-reactive protein, their C-reactive protein is greatly elevated. So they have what we call silent or hidden inflammation. It's inflammation for an unknown reason. And I think for those people, it would be very useful to test CRP uh, to see if that's occurring. Uh, and also, I think really using frequent CRP measurements, uh, it can be used to track how you're doing over time. So if you want to implement a new anti-inflammatory diet, Measuring CRP could tell you if it's actually helping or not. So I do think even though in common medical practice, CRP is not employed often, I think it should be used more often for the reasons that um, I mentioned. So I think it's really good for tracking. Now, there's another reason why CRP is really important, or I guess potentially important, where I think it can play a very powerful role in treating these conditions is if we can track CRP continuously at home. And there are some companies that are working on devices that will allow you to continuously track your level of inflammation at home. Like, um, like if you have a, a glucose monitor for diabetes, so it can, it can give you real-time plots so you can see spikes of inflammation. Now, you can think about how that might be useful. If you have real-time inflammation, you can try your different potential triggers and then look at your inflammatory monitor to see if it's causing inflammation. So you may drink milk, for example, 15 min minutes later, get a huge inflammatory spike, and then you know, oh, I just need to avoid milk. It could be that simple. I think that would be an incredible tool. Um, but in order to give that topic justice, I need to do a separate video. So I will talk about that soon. I just wanted to plant that idea in your head because I think it's going to be so important uh, in the future. I think CRP is going to be a really important tool in the future. But for right now, I just want to be clear that tracking CRP is research only. That is not common medical practice. It's things that we're testing that may become common medical practice in the future. In the meantime, you can always ask your physician to run C-reactive protein. It's a pretty cheap test, at least here in the United States. It's not that expensive to run, and it's in any hospital, any lab can run it. It's, it's, uh, it's easy to get a hold of. So that's it for today. Um, again, we'll find out next week probably what CRP looks like in these other conditions that you may have, and I hope that information is helpful, and I thank you for listening.